we have a developing situation in Idaho. The investigation continuing into the murder of four college students. Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter is joining us live tonight from outside that home. Uh, Chanley, you've been there all day, all night. What's happening? Hey, Vinny, I have some new updates from when I was on with you last, and that is the photographers, the crime scene investigators still inside this home at time because we can literally see them through the second story window in their crime scene suits. You know, they cover themselves so they don't leave anything behind as they collect forensic evidence. We can see them up there on that second floor still working. But in the meantime, the third floor, uh, there was the middle window on the third floor. The light was on when I was live with you last. Now the light is turned off on the third floor. Uh, but before we noticed the third floor window light, uh, the light turned off through the window, there were photographers up there, like we witnessed on your show just moments ago on the second floor, uh, CSI taking photos. As we can see now on the second floor, they're taking photos. So uh, they're still actively working this scene. They've been here all day long. It's been roped off with crime scene tape. We see uh, the victim's vehicle still parked out front. Uh, we've seen investigators walk in and out of the front door of this home carrying uh, giant boxes, I presume full of evidence. On the back side, we witnessed investigators, of course, taking out evidence from the back door, which is the second floor of this house through a sliding door. They were actually dusting for fingerprints on the back window pane next to that sliding door. And this is uh, almost a week after four University of Idaho students were found brutally murdered inside this home. And what we've been hearing in the report, what's being reported, is that two of the victims were on the second floor where we see now the crime scene investigators collecting uh, forensics and on the third floor of this home is where they were actually located. We're also learning some new details from the Moscow Police Department this evening. They're confirming that, of course, the four uh, murdered inside were stabbed to death multiple times while they were likely asleep. Some had defensive wounds. Uh, maybe they heard what was going on and, and woke up. We don't know, but we're confirming there's no sign of any sexual assault or what maybe some have speculated as motive in this crime. Also, there were two surviving roommates in this uh, multi-room home uh, that were unharmed, and the detectives have uh, ruled them out. They believe that the two surviving roommates and a man, a young man, that is seen in video at the food truck where two of the victims were uh, hours before their death, they've ruled them out. They are not involved in this crime. Additionally, we learned from the police uh, this evening that any rumors that these victims had been tied or gagged, that was not accurate. They still, though, aren't releasing who called 911 because they're saying that these murders happened around maybe 3 or 4 a.m. last Sunday morning. Police were not called until noon, and they arrived to this home with the front door wide open. They've released that there's no signs of forced entry in this home. And when we've been here, we've noticed that the front door has a door handle with a security code lock pad uh, that some sense of uh, maybe security here at the home, but they say no forced entry. Uh, and this is still no murder weapon found, still no suspect or suspects named. Uh, we know that the dumpsters that are to my right and left here at the home, they've collected items. They did mention that. And they also are confirming that they've contacted local businesses here to determine if a fixed blade knife had been recently purchased. Uh, the Idaho statesman had talked to a local hardware owner store, uh, and he says that the police were in town asking about some kind of a combat style or Rambo style knife blade. Uh, that's just so scary to think about uh, here, Vinny. And this happened here. I've been out in, t in the town talking to people and neighbors without any arrest and really not much info from the authorities. You know, many people are still on edge and in fear, have left town. I've talked to the neighbors. I know I spoke with one with you live on air just an hour ago, but we've spoken to more since we've been out here. They say that, you know, this is just steps from the University of Idaho campus. A lot of students live here. And so as you can imagine, the parties happen here. We're less than a block from Fraternity Row, 
on campus where two of the victims were at a party before their deaths. So the neighbors say that, you know, it's usual to have parties in this area at this home where we're where the, where the crime scene is. And it's not unusual to hear you know, people excited or screaming or, you know, just being loud. Uh, they, the neighbor I talked to earlier said they just put on a fan, they drown out the noise and they go to sleep. So it is unusually, unusually quiet here and people are being more cautious not only here in this area, but on the campus, people, uh, students have gone home for the Thanksgiving holiday. And you can definitely see Vinny, the increased security, not just of the uh, campus police and Moscow police, but uh, state police here, as well as the FBI are inside this home right now. Um, and private security, the campus has hired private security as well. I could understand. Uh, and again, you're looking at live pictures, folks. This is uh, inside the murder house. You've got photographers with their uh, protective gear on that are taking pictures of the murder scenes. Uh, this is a three-level house, as Chanley has told us. The, the murders, we believe, took place on the second and third floor. Uh, that second level can be accessed uh, from ground floor behind uh, the home. From this side, where Chanley is, uh, that front door kind of goes to the lower level, the basement level. Chanley describing it, you know, a lot of parties, it's college. Yeah, and you got red cups right there. There they are. Um, it's just tip, a typical college house. Typical college kids doing what college kids do, only in this case, someone entered that scene and took the lives of four of them. Um, Chanley, uh, so just to, once again, I want to go over the big headlines that you've told us. I want to make sure no one is missing this. And you've got, on, on the one hand, and, tell, and correct me if I'm wrong, the murder's taking place on the second and third level. Coroner believes everyone may have been sleeping. They think it happened at some time around 3 in the morning. We've gone through a timeline. It seems everyone got back around 1.45, although there was some reporting um, from one of the sisters of one of the victims that her sister may have been on the phone with her friend uh, a little bit later, like after 2 o'clock, 2.30 or so. Um, and they're looking for a Rambo-style six-inch bladed knife is what they believe may be the murder weapon here, although they have not recovered anything. Did I get it all right, Chanley? Yes, you did, uh, Vinny, and one of the fathers of, I think it was Zana, her dad uh, spoke with her just midnight, you know, the night uh, she was murdered. And you mentioned the knife that they're looking for, the victim was stabbed multiple times in their rooms. It seems as though what we're showing you right now, that's a room on the back side of the second floor that they are inside. And Vinny, we have a photo of what's on the outside of that room, and that's blood seeping through the walls where the crime scene technicians are right now taking photos and collecting evidence so it's on the back side of what we're showing you currently uh this is such eerie i mean that just goes to the magnitude of this scene the brutality uh it's just unbelievable uh, this is active scene all day this you know we see right now uh, media from all over the nation as you can tell Vinny, this is a growing story this is a community that wants answers and family members of these victims as you mentioned speaking out even conducting their own investigations trying to find video from neighbors here there are tons of neighbors here and this this house is surrounded by other buildings with multiple residences and apartment complex and condos surrounding this kind of on a hill incline you have to wind your way up a hill uh, but for gps i would not know I mean, you just can't randomly find this home Vinny. it is so apparent being here on the ground why the authorities think that this is a targeted attack not only were there survivors in the home that were unhurt but you have to know where you're going to get here Vinny. it's so clear uh, that whoever or did this or multiple people, we don't know, one or more people that did this, uh, knew who was in this home and where to go and how to get here. Yeah, that's a, that's a key factor, right? If, if it's targeted, right, whether it's targeted by a stranger who's been observing them for some time or somebody involved in their lives, they may have had to have been in there previously because this is a three-level home with six bedrooms six bedrooms so it's not so easy to find someone if you just see someone walk inside you'd have to know a little bit about the layout of this place 
Uh, Chanley Painter in Moscow, Idaho tonight. I want to bring into our conversation our think tank tonight. Uh, joining us in New York City, former senior homicide prosecutor Bernardo Villalona. In Los Angeles, California, deputy public defender for L.A. County, Philip Dubé. And in San Diego, California, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor Brian Watkins. And, of course, you can always contact Brian at brianwatkinslaw.com. Uh, Bernarda, uh, homicide prosecutor, six days later now. I mean, this murder took place late Saturday and really Sunday morning, but it's after the Saturday night into the early Sunday morning hours. This is now Friday night. It's dark in Idaho. Um, what does it tell you, the fact that they are still photographing the murder scene? It definitely tells me that they are trying to cover every inch of that house, every inch in terms of photographing, in terms of uh, drawing dry diagrams, in terms of swabbing for DNA, swabbing for fingerprints. They are trying to cover all their bases in order to conduct a thorough investigation. Because I'm nervous about this, Vinny. I'll tell you this, because if it ends up that someone is apprehended for this, it can be a circumstantial case unless they get a statement and admission from the person that actually caused the murder of these individuals. But for now, it definitely tells me that they are covering all their bases because they don't have a lead in this case. But they're going to have a lot of profiles to go through in terms of what comes back for the DNA. Right. Philip Dubé, that DNA is crucial, right? Because while you get the DNA, because the killer may have cut his or herself, right? If the killer cuts themselves and their DNA is left at the scene, uh, but they have never committed a crime before, you may not be able to find them through DNA. But if you do find them a different way, that's how you can prosecute them. Yes, CODIS is a combined DNA index that is the national data bank that stores all the DNA samples collected from arrestees and convicts uh, in the United States. And I think they're even working on an international database. So yes, if the offender is not, re not already uh, on record, uh, even if they get a hit from that scene of some foreign donor that doesn't match these young kids, uh, it could take a while before they finally uh, apprehend a suspect. But uh, I do believe, though, that they have brought some type of a profiler to the scene to try to get into the mind of the person who would have done this. And I think it's obvious that they've ruled out this being a property crime because there's no evidence of a true burglary or a robbery or a theft. It certainly wasn't sexually motivated. Uh, it doesn't look like they were trying to dissuade a witness by destroying evidence of any type. Uh, so what are you left with? You're left with maybe a satanic cult ritual of some type or maybe a, a street gang initiation or a vendetta or to quote Tamron Hall, someone they knew. This was up close and personal, targeted in an area that somebody had to be familiar with. I have a feeling they're going to get cell tower data where a foreign phone pinged off a tower in that area and that's how they're going to get a hit. All right, Brian Watkins, I'm going to uh, throw you a curveball here. This is a, a super hypothetical, but I'm looking at the situation. Um, the killer could potentially be a student, a classmate, right? This campus has emptied out. All these students are going home for Thanksgiving. We could end up with uh, a, a quasi Brian Laundry situation here where the killer goes home for Thanksgiving, confesses, to their parents, because the parents are going to be talking to all the students who are coming back uh, from campus, right? And, and, and say, for instance, again, super hypothetically here, Brian, what happens if this person confesses to their parents over Thanksgiving? The parents are like, we need to get a lawyer. They go to a lawyer's office, and now the lawyer knows everything. Uh, what happens with that information? Nothing. That's the problem. The police want to come and question that young man. His lawyer is going to say, no, you cannot. So it's very unlikely that the police are going to be able to get a confession directly out of the perpetrator here because the lawyer is going to insulate that. Now, the fact that they the lawyer can't lawyer, say anything, right? Lawyer can say can't say. Zip. Absolutely not. We protect the client to our own peril. That's what our just criminal justice system is about. And I can tell you, Vinny, this is going to be a tough case because you talk about DNA and fingerprints and that type of what we call hard or physical evidence is not going to mean that much at a party house. You know how many people's DNA has been in that house? You know how many That's people have been in that point. house party? That's a great point, Brian. Their fingerprints? My DNA's there? Sure. I partied with her. I partied with these guys all the time, you know? So there's a lot of DNA, a lot of fingerprints in there, how to cipher out which one killed these 
poor, poor, innocent students is going to be tough. Uh, Bernard, and then I think we get back to what Philip Dubé was talking about, which is the cell phone. I mean, if, if the killer's got a cell phone and that cell phone is on, it's pinging. It is pinging. And uh, they'll be able to uh, do a pretty good job of placing that killer at the scene at the time. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that happens at times and it does help. However, you gotta think, <clears throat> you gotta think that if they even recover, they're gonna recover a whole bunch of cell phone data. So they're gonna have to go through them individually. And when they investigate these individuals, they have to figure out who had a valid reason to be at this location and they'll bring them in. But just like Brian said, if they decide not to speak, they don't have to speak. So we're back to square one, but at least the investigators and law enforcement have people that they have placed in the area. And it could work both ways. It works for the prosecution and it could work for the defense. If there's a prosecution, be like, wait, there were other people that were in the area at the same time. Have they been excluded? Also, we're also assuming that the whoever the perpetrator was had their phone on or there was some kind of usage on their phone. Because if your phone is off, it is not going to ping in any location if your phone is off. All right, Think Tank with us the whole hour. Uh, big thank you to Chanley Painter tonight out in Moscow, Idaho, uh, bringing us all this information tonight and to our whole crew out there bringing us these images as investigators continue. Uh, unbelievable story, folks. Uh, again, think about it. You've got a college campus, four college students murdered, and everybody else terrified because the killer hasn't been caught. We don't know why they did it. We don't know who they are, and we certainly don't know where they are tonight.